Welcome to the hashtag Proud to be LBUSD podcast series. I'm your host, Christopher J. Itson, and today on the show, we have Dr. Olga Grimalt, District Administrator from the Office of Curriculum Instruction and Professional Development. Dr. Grimalt is joining us for this episode to talk about LBUSD's multiple dual immersion programs and how they benefit students academically and beyond. So Dr. Grimalt, thank you for joining us and welcome to the studio. Thank you. So happy to be here. So we usually like to start by uh, helping our listeners learn a bit about our guests. So I know your administrator works with English language development team um, in what we all call OCIPD for everyone at home. That's the Office of Curriculum Instruction and Professional Development. Um, but I also know you have a pretty fascinating journey to get where you are now. Um, so would you tell our audience about your background and how you got to the, the place you're at now as a district leader? Sure. So I began teaching in the Los Angeles Unified School District um, many years ago, back in 1990, um, as a bilingual teacher. And it was really bilingual education that brought me to education, just the idea of being able to teach uh, in a classroom in both English and Spanish was what um, really attracted me to the profession. So I started off in L.A., and a few years later, I moved to Long Beach and came to Long Beach Unified and continued that work um, in our district and, and, and since then had, you know, stayed with Long Beach Unified. Um, but there was a short amount of time when I left the district uh, in 2008 and went to um, higher ed. So I pursued a doctorate degree and at that time was working um, in teacher ed, so preparing bilingual teachers. So I went from working in the classroom and then having some out-of-classroom experiences as well in Long Beach and then going to the university and working with, the, with teacher preparation in, with Spanish bilingual candidates and Mandarin bilingual candidates. And so did that for a number of years and, um, and then left higher ed, did some consulting with districts, um, launching programs, and then had the opportunity to come back to Long Beach in 2018 to launch a new program um, when we were launching Bixby Elementary School. So I decided to go back to the classroom after many years um, and taught kindergarten at Bixby for a couple of years. Uh, to get that program up and running, um, and then had the opportunity to come out of the classroom again as a dual immersion coach last year, and then this year as the coordinator of our new multilingual services office. That's so, so cool. When you, um, what was that like? Sorry, because you're up there. What was that like going back to the classroom after all that time and after doing all of that more administrative work and support? It was one of the hardest things that I've done because hmm. I was out of the classroom for 17 years. Wow. And I had never taught kindergarten. And so as a bilingual teacher, what I learned is um, a lot about early literacy and early language development, because hmm. I had been an upper grade teacher. So in third and fourth grade, the students already came to me bilingual. Um, but now for the first time, I was working with students who truly didn't speak Spanish, because most of my students were Spanish learners. And um, so that was, it, one, it was difficult, just kindergarten. My hat goes off to all kindergarten teachers. Um, I always knew kindergarten was a really challenging grade, and now I can speak to it. And, um, and then also having students who didn't understand anything that I was saying and, and really understanding the importance of comprehensible input and how all the theoretical things that I had taught in higher ed that now I saw in my classroom and how I as a teacher had to um, help my students understand the content they were learning even if they didn't understand all the words that I was saying. So it was, it was one of the most challenging things that I've done and I learned so much in those two years and um, was happy to have an opportunity to come out of the classroom again because I think the, the work that I do now is really what I'm passionate about in terms of um, supporting programs and, and implementing new programs. Uh, but definitely those two years were kind of instrumental as I now also provide PD, um, both in and out of the district in terms of, um, I can really speak to those early, um, or those beginning, or, or that early development of language acquisition. And that's powerful, right? Because you, I mean, you talk about all that, having this rich experience in theory and developing that and then having to put it into practice yourself and then coming back out, I mean, that's got to just given you so much more perspective yeah, in, in supporting them. Absolutely. So what do you do now? Let's talk a little bit about that. What's what's just briefly, because I want to get to, you, you said something that I bet anyone listening would be confused when you said they didn't speak any Spanish at all. I know we're going to talk about that with what how dual immersion works in yeah. Long Beach um, or in general. But what, what do you do now? Like when you talk about implementing programs and supporting with PD, what's some, what does that look like? 
So overall, my my um, position right now is that I'm the coordinator, one of the coordinators of our multilingual services office, and we work um, or we oversee the programs that are uh, related to our English learners in the district, um, world languages, and dual immersion. Um, so now the scope of my work is a little broader um, than it has been because my my focus primarily was on um, just bilingual ed in, hmm. in general. Um, so in terms of dual language programs, we provide um, our office, we have a, co a couple of coaches in our office that focus on the dual immersion programs and um, we're developing unit guides for those um, schools and for the, our, you know, our different models that we have in our district. Um, we're actually calling them biliteracy guides because we're really trying to provide um, guidance around both Spanish language arts and the English instructional time of our of our day. Um, and so doing that, providing office hours for teachers, doing some PD, going out to sites and meeting with the programs we have. Many of our teachers that have been in our programs for many years, and then because our programs are growing, a lot of new teachers as well. So the need to just provide PD just at the site level, just so that all, everyone who's participating, I always say to the principals, I want to come and talk to them about Dual Immersion 101 so that your new teachers understand what they just signed up for. Because <laughs> um, it's challenging. Being a dual language teacher is really, um, it can be very challenging. Um, but I think what drives everyone is just this love for language and, and just seeing the students become bilingual. That's, um, that's awesome. Let's talk about that. So what, what are, um, what is dual immersion exactly? You know, and, and, and I know, you know, when you look at the formal term of du dual language immersion, um, but we, you know, we call it DI sometimes in the district. So what does it look like? Um, you know, s scope it out. Well, how many uh, students are currently in the programs? What schools is that? General kind of history. Like what, what is, when you say dual immersion language in, in Long Beach Unified, what does that look like? So the term dual immersion, it's funny because there's, you might hear dual immersion, you might hear dual language immersion, you might hear two-way immersion. And the thing um, to, to know just specifically about what makes dual immersion different from other models is in a dual immersion program, it's an instructional program where it, children are learning content through two languages. So English, of course, and then another language. And in our district, our programs are English-Spanish programs. Um, I've worked in the past, like I mentioned, the Mandarin bilingual program. Mm -hmm. um, other districts might have Mandarin English programs or a, a multitude of languages, right? But in our district right now, our focus is on the Spanish-English um, programs. And But what, what really distinguishes it from other types of bilingual uh, models is that the classroom is made up of students who are native speakers of Spanish or fluent speakers of Spanish and English only students. So it, it's a program that's open to everybody. Um, all students, any student can um, participate in the program. Um, the program does begin in kindergarten. So it's important for students to start uh, at the kinder um, and sometimes at the first grade level as well. Um, because of the language development piece of the program. If you come into the program in fourth grade, for example, in terms of Spanish development, you're, you know, and you speak no Spanish at all, it's just, it's, you, you won't be able to reach the levels of bilingualism and biliteracy that we are working towards by fifth grade. So the goals of our program are that. The goals of a dual immersion program are bilingualism and biliteracy, um, high academic achievement through you know, content being taught in two languages and social cultural competence. Um, so there's also the cultural competence of um, the culture of the language, but also of the students being in an educational setting that's diverse, where they're also learning from each other. Um, and, and so that's why, you know, if you come into the program later in the program, it's just hard to reach um, the goals of the program. Um, and so in our district, we have six dual immersion programs that are in elementary schools right now. And four of our schools are what we call 90-10 programs, and two of our schools are 50-50 programs. So all of our programs have the same goals. Um, we're all reaching that goal of bilingualism, biliteracy. I always tell when I do PDs or talk to families, I say that's the prize. The prize is that our students are becoming bilingual, biliterate. Um, and um, oh, I thought it's my train of thought where I was going with all that. Um, and, oh, so our, our program models, that's what I was talking about. And so we have 
two models that just briefly, I'll just, you know, describe the difference between the two um, is just the way that students learn literacy. So in our 9010 programs, the philosophy is that all students learn how to read in Spanish first, and then they transfer that knowledge to English reading. In our 50-50 programs, the students are learning literacy in both languages starting in kindergarten. And I should add that we do have a few schools that do offer TK for DI as well. So, and we're looking at some of our sites to add the TK grade as well. And what's TK for our audience? Um, transitional kindergarten. So it's those students that are not quite um, meet the age requirement for kindergarten, and um, but but do meet the age requirement for the transitional kindergarten. Correct. Right, so they class. typically like they're five within the first like so before I think our December. Our cutoff or something like is that. like is September first for kindergarten. And um, and for TK, I'm not sure what the exact dates are, but it's those fall students, yeah. the students born the between September and probably around December. So expand on that 90-10. Like, what is that like? Like, give us a picture of that. What that looks like, because you know, there's some fear and trepidation sometimes in that model. Mm -hmm. So, what what does it look like, and and what's maybe the benefit from your expertise in in language acquisition and development? So like I said, with the 90, 10, the, the 90 and the 10 refer to the percentage of time, um, instructional time in each language. So starting in kindergarten in a 90, 10 program, 90% of the instructional day is in Spanish, for example, mm. and 10% is in English. Mm. So the bulk of all instruction, um, literacy, math, science, social studies is all through um, Spanish is the language of instruction. So I was saying earlier that, that when I was teaching kinder at Bixby, the majority of my students were English-only students, or some students that had some receptive skills in Spanish. I didn't have very many students that could speak Spanish um, fluently. And, and so they're learning all the content through that language, and that's what made it challenging because they couldn't understand everything that I was saying. But with that said, it's amazing to see how quickly the, stu the students learn, and, and I could say within the first month of school, their receptive skills, I mean, just move very quickly, even if they're not ready yet to express themselves in Spanish, but just their level of understanding moves really quickly. It's so fascinating to me because I think that because you don't, you did not speak English to them at all, right? Because isn't there Never. English, the 10 is done by another exactly. an English teacher. So, right? right. And so we have the two teacher model, which one teacher serves as a Spanish model, language model, and the other teacher serves as the English model. So during that 10%, which is about 30 minutes of the school day, the teacher in kindergarten, usually the teacher switch um, just because it's too, um, a little bit too chaotic to have the little ones oh, yeah. oh, do the switching. The yeah. Um, although we started to have the kids switch around February, March, just because once first through third grade, then the kids do the switching. Hmm. The teachers don't have to switch. But we do it. So I had another. So I really taught 60 kids. I taught 30 kids who were a set of 30 students who were my Spanish students and then the other class of 30 who were my English students. Um, and and with my Spanish students, I never, ever, ever um, hmm. spoke English to them ever. So that became kind of a game with them, too, because they would ask me all the time, do you speak English? And and so I felt bad lying to them and saying, no, I don't. So I would always answer, I'm bilingual. Um, and I would talk to them a lot about that. I talked a lot about being bilingual and what it meant to be bilingual and why you're in this classroom. Because a lot of the kids have no idea why, you know, first, why why do I have a teacher that I don't understand what they're saying? And um, and they don't know what dual immersion is mm -hmm. when they're when they're that age. Um, but anyway, but it became, it became a joke with my students because they kept asking and they kept trying to catch me. Yeah, they're trying to trip you um, up and get yeah, you to say something Yeah, they weren't sure. They would come back from recess and say, you know, so-and-so from room seven says that when you go to that classroom, you speak English to them. And so then I would always respond, I'm bilingual. I'm bilingual. But, but in this classroom, I only speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. Um, so what a cool modeling kind of too. I mean, talking about that, of you, of you, I mean, you're modeling that and then you're, you're having this, this rich conversation about the importance of being bilingual or how it can benefit you and everything. And then, so they're seeing it in action at the same time. I think that's right. really, because yeah. I, I, I totally see what you're saying where, you know, a parent is like, I definitely want my kid to go into dual immersion. I know we have some programs that are super impacted and stuff, but yeah, you're, you're in a five-year-old and you're like, well, what is going on here? I, th I think of, I, I can't imagine what that first day is for a student when they walk in and their teacher is just speaking a different language yeah. and they don't break. I mean, do you have any, um, any issues with students? Like, really struggling with that in the beginning, like even emotionally or just behaviorally? I don't, I don't think that the students 
because they've never done kindergarten before, that they really understand that kinder could be different. You know, other than they know that they're not, they don't understand the teacher. But I don't think, I've never had an experience where a child is saying, well, I want to be across the hall or, you know, some of our schools, the program is a strand within the school. It's not the whole school. So there are definite English only classrooms at the school. And you don't hear the students saying, well, I want to be in that classroom because Spanish isn't happening over there. I don't think they realize that, that kindergarten could be different. Um, so I, my experience has been that they're very open to it, even though, um, even though, you know, they're not understanding everything. We use a lot of strategies to help the students comprehend. So I think their level of not understanding also is maybe isn't even as high as I might think because we use visuals and gestures and songs and just all kinds of ways to help the students understand what's happening in the classroom. And so um, so I know that all of our dual immersion kindergarten teachers are very aware of, you know, especially at that first level, right? At that, that kind of in, you know, when the kids first join the program um, in terms of supporting students with language. So when, so for my classroom, for example, and I'll tell parents this all the time, I did not have more kids crying in my classroom than the English only classroom. Mm. I didn't have more, um, years ago I was coordinator at Patrick Henry um, in I think 2002 to 2006. And those first few days of school, at that time, Henry, the dual immersion program was a strand within the school. And um, so we had both schools. We had, we had both programs, an English only program and a dual immersion program. We didn't have more kids crying or we didn't have more runners or we didn't have more issues with the dual immersion program students than we did with the English only students. It was kids. just kindergarten issues that mm -hmm. we all faced. So I, and I had the same, I had the student that cried every day for a week. Um, so as a teacher, you do the same thing any other teacher would do, just comfort that child and, and, and then make the learning fun. So they, they want to come back. <laughs> That's so cool. So uh, you, you touched on something being, and I, and I, and you and I have had some conversations about this in the past, but so can you define like what an English learner is for our audience mm -hmm. very briefly? And then why is this a benefit for them? Because I've heard, you know, the misconception that, you know, if I, if I am only a Spanish speaker coming into the school or I barely speak any English, that this is not a program for me. This is the program for the kids that are going to learn Spanish. But I know that that's not the case. Right. And I think one of the things with our 90-10 programs also is that there's a little bit of fear that because we focus kinder first and second grade, the focus is Spanish literacy. So one thing I didn't mention before is just to explain the, the model a little bit further is that in kinder, the percentage of time in Spanish is 90 percent and English instruction is 10 percent. But then each subsequent grade, our percentage of time of English increases. Mm. And so sometimes... 90, the, the percentage of 90, 10 um, stays in kinder and first, and then starts to increase to 80, 20, 70, 30, um, 60, 40, until we reach 50, 50 and fourth or fifth grade. Um, sometimes we switch to 80, 20 and first grade. There's really not a big reason why there's a difference of 30 minutes from one grade to the next. But the, but the program is designed so that each subsequent grade gets 30 more minutes of English instructional time until we reach a split of 50-50. Um, and then the 50-50 programs, you know, it's 50-50 kinder through fifth grade. So the 50-50 sometimes are easier sells for the community or families because there's that um, assurance that, oh, but they're also receiving instruction in English. And with the 90-10, there sometimes could be a little bit of fear of, oh, but you don't really start formal English reading until third grade. But what I explained to families is that the students, all of the standards that they're be, that are being met in the prior grade, you know, before third grade, are the same Common Core standards, and and that literacy is literacy, and so all those mm -hmm. literacy skills that they're learning transfer to English. And so, as a former third grade dual immersion teacher, the students did not come to me at a third grade reading level in Spanish and then a pre K or kinder level in English they start to naturally transfer um, those skills. Mm -hmm. So for our English learners who, you know, are a very important part of these, the program because they provide that Spanish model. And, and, and it, so real quick, those are, those are students who either speak no English coming into the school or maybe a little bit of English but are fluent in Spanish. Exactly. So those are students. I mean, exactly. we know we have other English learners, but for this model, thinking for, of dual for, version. Right. 
And so it's right. So there are students who speak an, a language other than English or there's an, a language other than English present in the home. And, um, and, and so they're coming to school and if they're in a bilingual program, they're learning in their primary lang hmm. language as well as learning English. Um, sometimes kids come as balanced bilinguals as well and mm. could be fluent Spanish speakers and fluent English speakers um, as well. Um, and so it's um, important to have those Spanish models. And that's something that across our programs, we're working with trying to balance those the classrooms because we just know in terms of the success of the program and um, for the students to develop those high level um, literacy skills in Spanish, it's just beneficial to have um, the kids as language models as well. Yeah, because there's two um, things there that are really cool. Because if you if if you're you're coming into it, and English is a second language for you, I mean, you're I feel like you're extremely benefiting, right? Because you're this transition. And I mean, I think of students I had when I was teaching that, like, I had a student who came from the Philippines and spoke no English. Right. I mean, day one of right. school, and 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 seeing you know the challenge that that student had, you know, went through and and everything. But if I'm walking in and I'm I mean, it just that it kind of, you know, flips the script there a little bit. But then also that's cool. I, I didn't ever thought about these with the modeling. Like, that's so cool because your teachers, you're modeling as, as an educator, but then you have your peers that you're connecting with in the room. It, there's that casualness too and that that relationship that, right. I, I don't know, it just enhances that, the communication process, I feel like, or the learning process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, and I, again, when in my kindergarten class, I was the only fluent um, model for Spanish. Um, and... You know, and we make it work anyway, but it just works even better when I can have the students, you know, engage in a conversation and, and one of the students um, is fluent in the language. It just, it just facilitates the learning of that language for the non-Spanish speakers and vice versa with our English instructional time as well, right? So then we have our English models mm -hmm. that are English learners. They also benefit from having those models as well when they're interacting um, with the students. So what's the, what's the, um, I mean, I know a little bit about it, but what's the noise in the system is not the right word. What's the draw for this? I mean, do we, are we bursting at the seams in these dual immersion programs? Like we have, we don't have enough spots for kids. Do we have schools where we're, we're, we're trying to actively recruit more? I mean, is it, is it a big, is it a hard sell or is it something that the community really wants? I think in general, it's something the community really wants. Um, I think that there are some sites where um, we may have to, or, or we're already planning on doing some more active recruiting just to inform our community. Um, I think our Latinx families sometimes are on the fence because they are committed for, you know, to have their students be fluent in English, right? And so with those families, many times I'll tell them, you know, but because they'll say, well, we'll take care of Spanish at home. And I'm bilingual, I'm Latina. My daughters went through the dual immersion program here in Long Beach um, as well. And, and so I tell, so it's great because I can talk to them, you know, on, mm. from a professional standpoint, but I can also talk to them from a personal standpoint, right? And, and tell them, you know, in my home, we spoke Spanish or we speak Spanish as well, but, but we're not having conversations about renewable energy around our dinner table in Spanish, hmm. but they are at school. So at school, they're getting that academic language. They're learning how to read and write at grade level. Those are things that are not gonna happen at home. So yeah, they may grow up and speak Spanish, but will they really be able to read it well? Will they be able to write it well? And would they, will they be able to have like that kind of academic discourse in both languages um, coming from home? So I tell them, not in my home, and then I always tell them, it's not happening in English either. It's like, I'm not saying that to say that it's happening in English and not in Spanish. It's not happening. We're, our lives are like, you know, we're rushing to go to soccer, to go here, to go there, whatever it is that we're doing. And in Spanish, my, you know, it's mostly commands. Did you do your homework? How was school? Like, like I said, I'm not having academic conversations with them um, just in general. So, so when I speak to the families, I just speak to that, to the importance of, for all of our students to become bilingual, biliterate, um, the advantages that that has as adults in terms of their ability, just, you know, just the job market and, and just being global citizens. Um, and it, it's, you know, those are the points that I try to get across when we have, um, families that aren't, aren't quite sure, about um, their students' participation in the program. But in general, I think the community is asking for it and the district is um, 
has plans to open new programs. Um, like I said, we have the six elementary schools right now, and Bixby and Chavez are our newest schools. So we had four schools for many years. Um, Patrick Henry is our was our you know is our flagship program. They've been there for over thirty years. Hmm. Um, and Webster, um, Lafayette, and Willard followed pretty closely behind Patrick Henry and um, have been in our district for many years. And then Bixby and Chavez are our newest our newest programs. Um, and then we've got the one middle school, Keller Middle School, that um, that students can continue with the dual immersion program in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, which I think those three grades are really important in terms of solidifying the language for the students. Um, I think when students go K-5 and then they stop, you never lose the language that you've acquired, but it could get weak. So I would say it's kind of like a muscle. Like if you don't exercise it, it might get weak, but you don't really lose it. But when the kids go through eighth grade, it just solidifies um, their reading literature. That's in Spanish at the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade level. It's not like your typical high school foreign language classes that maybe at the you know middle or high school level, you're doing very basic Spanish things. Our dual immersion kids in the middle school are engaged in yeah, academic grade level content um, in both languages. So that's what's really cool. And that, I like that you brought up the biliteracy so much because I think that's a, something, I mean, you're just sitting here thinking about it. Like when you hear someone's bilingual, I have friends that grew up um, speaking Spanish in the home that can't read very well in Spanish. You know, yeah. they can speak it, you know, or, or I've had um, people I've worked with where I'm, you know, we do a lot of translation work in our work and I'll be like, hey, can you translate this paragraph for me? And they'll struggle. And they're like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I can, but it's going to take me a while. No one to run it by. And it's interesting to think about it that way, that that higher level thinking that they're getting and that those building those higher level skills beyond just being able to speak a language. Like you said, like right. you, I think of foreign language classes in high school and it was, right. like, it was rudimentary and it was basic and you know, maybe a few kids went on or went on to, you know, programs in college and things like that. For the most part, it's like, oh, yeah, I know the alphabet and I know a few things, but not learning it. And I, it's interesting to think about how that middle school would solidify that. So what happens to the students that don't do the middle school, though? Like, I mean, do we do they still like are there like are there other options or there other? I mean, is that is that an issue that we have in the district where, where we're like, man, we have these six schools, but we only have this one middle school. Is everybody clamoring to get in or? So we are looking to start another middle school program. I, we don't have like a specific date yet, mm -hmm. but we are talking about needing another middle school program, especially more on the west side of Long Beach because our middle school is now on the, it's probably as far east as yeah, you can get great, in Long yeah. Beach. <laughs> and um, so accessibility has been an issue. So for our students that are coming out of the elementary schools on the west side that may not have transportation to go that far east, let's say. So um, so we definitely are looking at um, establishing another middle school program so just for accessibility. And if we continue to open elementary programs, it's something we definitely will need. Yeah, it's been part um, of the and, and then the other thing too that for our students in terms of goals is that we have the state seal of bi biliteracy, that the students by going through the dual immersion program easily can attain um, it's something that it's, uh, they get the, the, it's a gold seal that's placed on their diploma. Um, uh, and, and I'm trying to think of the, the exact requirements that they have at the high school level. They have to pass like the AP Spanish language test, for example, is one of the criteria. And many of our eighth graders take the AP Spanish language exam in, in eighth grade, the wow. ones in the dual immersion program and, and pass it. So it's like, check, okay, you've already, you know, passed that criteria and you're, you know, getting closer to, to being able to receive that seal upon graduation. So that's something that's really exciting because it's a state seal. It's not, um, just something, you know, that uh, our own in-house Long Beach recognition, but some, uh, something that the state, you know, is, um, recognizing our students that, are reaching those high levels of bilingualism and biliteracy. And you think of college and career readiness. I mean, you're I mean, right. marketable, you know, for jo the job world. It's it's amazing. I mean, yeah. I mean, just having the skill, like you said, it, it's, it should be, you know, I've always said something that should be a cultural value in our country that everybody should, you know, you go to most other countries and people speak multiple uh, absolutely. languages. That's absolutely a, a norm where in America it's really not for a lot of the population. So, but it's so cool because just thinking of, I mean, just that skill set going out and then, and then, getting that seal even, how much more marketable are you when you're applying to college or you're or just applying for a career to say, I have this skill. So what's the future of DI look like in LB? And I know you can't share everything and there's always plans in the work, but what are some things of where we're going? You've talked a little bit about expanding. I mean, what's the, what's the thought process right now? 
So right now we're looking at, we have one um, school that we've identified that will be launching a new program in the next school year at Riley Elementary School. So we've already identified that school and I'm excited to work with the community and start kind of the recruitment process for, for a new program. And where's and Riley? Riley is in Lakewood um, off of Del Amo, behind Balboa Park. I think it's Balboa okay. Park. Uh, and... So just really looking strategically across the city, uh, where our current programs are located, where are there areas that the community doesn't have access um, to or close access to a program. So I know one of the areas we're looking at as well as North Long Beach and really looking at just like I said, across the city to see um, where there's a need, where there's interest and and where there are sites that we could uh include a dual immersion program at the site. And so, like I said earlier, some of our sites are um, whole school programs, and some of them have um, both our English only and our dual immersion, um, a dual immersion strand within the school. And that just so gives you more flexibility, one, right? I mean, yeah. it seems like with staffing and resources and stuff, having that, that's kind of makes it a little bit easier sometimes if you can't fully implement, like we're all in DI at this school, but right. we only have the resources to do it or the need, like you're saying, right. or the demand, you know, could be right. less as exactly. well. Exactly. And, and finding, you know, um, certified teachers is, is one of the most challenging um, parts of, of, uh, of implementing a program. So um, I think we're being very thoughtful of doing it. Um, I don't want to say like in a, with a slow pace, but just doing it in a way that we know, okay, we can staff um, all of our schools with um, fully credentialed bilingual teachers, which is what we need sure. to be able so to run the program. Being methodical. Yeah. So what if, what's the, what, what's the credential for that? So students, uh, teachers would need a multiple subjects credential with the bilingual authorization. Authorization, okay. And, and there's multi multiple ways for teachers to get the, they can get the authorization through test or they can do it through coursework. They could do it as part of their initial Credential. credentialing process. Um, and so there's multiple ways to do that. But what I remind us here in our district is that we're also competing with cities around us um, that everybody is, is implementing dual immersion programs. So um, it's being able to um, partner with our universities and being kind of first in line for the candidates that are graduating and because we're we're competing with other districts that are also establishing programs. So mm. uh, it's it's um, it's exciting. It's a very exciting time to be a bilingual educator. And but at the same time, you know, it's something that's become very popular in the last, I would say, gosh, I guess 10 maybe 10 years. Um, we went through a time period, like after Prop 227 passed, where there weren't as many programs that were being implemented. And then I want to say around 2015, around there, and then Prop 58 that passed in 2016 really was kind of the state turning around and saying, no, we do value um, multilingualism. And in fact, at the state level, um, th the California Department of Ed has a goal of by 2040, um, three out of four of our students graduating as bilingual biliterate That's cool. um, citizens. So even the state has now, you know, really like robust goals about around bilingualism. And that's nice that we're, we've had such a rich experience in this district of, of moving that work, right? I mean, it's not, I mean, I think, I know there's other programs in other districts, but you know, what if you're a district that you are just getting into this work and implementing these programs? And obviously that's a, that's a long way off, but but still, that's kind of really cool that we already have a system and you're oh, absolutely. methodically expanding and looking for areas absolutely, the... Absolutely. I mean, we have a long history in our district, over 30 years of having a dual immersion program. So definitely not something that's new to, uh, for us. So is there anything I didn't ask you? Anything you want to share with the community? Anything you want to plug, events or anything? So we will be at Education Celebration. Our office, the Multilingual Services Office, will have a booth at Education Celebration on January 29th at Cabrillo High School, uh, where families can come and we'll, we'll be there to talk about all of our programs. And then each of our sites that offer a program will also be at Education Celebration. And families can also visit the individual schools and talk to them about their programs as well. So that's our next event that's coming up in January. And I'm um, always excited about um, talking to families. And typically at Education Celebration, we get a lot of the incoming kindergarten families that are looking to speak to the schools directly. So that, you know, it's just exciting to, to kind of participate with that and tell families about. And again, for me, it's my, my daughters are in college now. So they, um, but they went through the program K-8 here in our 
district. So I, I really enjoy talking to families and being able to say to them, my daughters did it. And, and coming from a Spanish-speaking household, I can guarantee you that my daughters would not have the levels of bilingualism and biliteracy that they have had they not participated in the dual immersion program in our district. Because um, English is the dominant language. You know, the girls, they, they're fully bilingual, but if I were to say, what do they speak more? Do they speak more English or Spanish? They probably speak more English than Spanish just because their world is more English dominant. Um, but like I said, but they wouldn't have the high levels of bilingualism uh, for sure. And you're the spokes, you're like the consummate spokesperson, right? I mean, you taught right. it. Right, Spanish right. Spanish-speaking <laughs> home, and you have children that went through it. That's really awesome. To, right. To be, and, and that's really cool to be able to share with families, I mean, to get that granular and that detailed about, like, look, this is my my experience. Is, this is possible. This is this is the reality of that. That's really cool. Right, yeah. Awesome. Well, so I think, I can't think of anything else. Just, you know, it's, it's something that, um, you know, when I ask parents who have participated as well and say, if you, you know, if you were to say something to families and, you know, it's always this overwhelming response of I'm so happy that my, you know, children went through the program. They, they're bilingual, they're biliterate, they speak, even our, our students that come in um, as English speakers. So I recently was at Bixby, my kind, my first kinder class, they're third graders and, happened to, you know, I stopped by the classroom to say hello. So when the children left kinder, you know, they were already speaking some Spanish, but they they weren't fluent yet. You don't expect them to be fluent at that point yet. It was astonishing. I don't know why I was surprised. I wasn't surprised. I was just so happy to see how the little ones who came in speaking no Spanish, they have no Spanish at home, and yet were speaking to me almost near fluent. It was just amazing to me. So it's um, just exciting. It's exciting to see how the students can embrace both languages. And when we talk about misconceptions, sometimes there's that fear that learning in Spanish is somehow going to hinder the English language development or literacy development. And it does not at all. For our English learners who are Spanish speakers, it does not hinder their development of English at all. Um, and for our English only students, it all the same. It doesn't keep them from continuing to progress um, with their English skills in any way. Um, it's just all benefits all the way around. Awesome. Well, Dr. Malt, thanks for being here today. Thank you.